So let's talk about what foodborne illness really is. Uh, what is it? Well, it is illness caused by contaminated food. It's estimated that one in six Americans get sick each year with foodborne illness and that 3,000 die. Um, this is pretty expensive. Um, it's estimated that $15.6 billion every year is spent on the illness and death related to foodborne illness. This type of illness is mostly unreported and underreported, and there are a few different reasons for that. Um, one being that people might not seek medical treatment um, since their symptoms might be on the mild side, or doctors don't make a specific diagnosis since there are so many different types of microorganisms that might be causing the illness. So the numbers that we have estimated might be um, severely under what is truly happening out there in regards to foodborne illness. So how do you get sick? What's the transmission of foodborne illness? These organisms that can get you sick, they exist naturally out in the environment um, and they're able to move with your health. So if we think about the type of microorganism um, that causes um, really severe intoxication and illness, um, most of them exist already naturally in the soil. Um, and so, as you know, many of our, a lot of our produce um, or even um, our meat products, you know, at their origin, they have some type of interaction with soil. Um, that soil can then get into um, a condition uh, within the restaurant where it can grow, um, which we'll talk about in a future slide. The um, ideal conditions can vary between different microorganisms on, on what type of environment they like to grow in. Um, but so these organisms, they exist naturally in places. They move with their health. So um, if we're moving, say, a garlic bulb, um, it's grown in the soil. Um, it might have some soil contamination. It's being pulled from the field and sent to a distribution center. Um, and then distribution center is sending it off to the stores in which you might purchase it for your home use or uh, purchase it for use in your restaurant where it may or may not be washed. Many people don't necessarily wash their garlic bulbs, but um, it might be in a condition then where Someone might chop that garlic, uh, put it in some oil, and then keep it at room temperature, which might be the ideal condition for a particular bacteria that happens to live in soil um, for it to grow. So then these microorganisms, they are able to get into your body um, via you eating it. And then once in your body, that microorganism itself can be harmful or the organism can create a toxin in the food or in within your body. And as I mentioned previously, please remember that toxins cannot be destroyed by regular cooking temperatures. So those are the most dangerous aspect of, of some of the foodborne illnesses that we talk about. There are also some organisms that are able to form heat resistant spores. Um, so when we're talking about something like um, Clostridium for fringens, um, they like to clump together. And if you think about uh, when these microorganisms clump together um, and you heat up the food product that they're in, the ones on the outside might die off based on the heat heating of that food product, but they are protecting the ones that are on the inside. Um, and so those might survive that, that heat process and be able to uh, be eaten and, and produce illness in someone. 
So, like I said, we were talking about the necessities for life and growth of these microorganisms, or we call the, the simple bare necessities here. There's an acronym to remember what these are, and that is that Tom. Um, so that is food, acidity, temperature, time, oxygen, and moisture. So if you think about all of these things that a microorganism might need, um, if you take a piece of raw beef, a slice of raw beef, and you dehydrate it, and then you put it in a package where you suck out all the air, you remove two of these items, you remove the moisture and you remove the oxygen, you can stick that you know, piece of beef jerky now that you've created on a shelf and extend that, that piece of beef shelf life for much longer than if you were to stick that raw piece of beef that contained oxygen and moisture. Um, those bacteria then would not be able to flourish without those two items missing. So um, also as another example, uh, many food products you'll see um, have something like citric acid added. Um, many, some of the dried fruit products or um, like applesauce might even have um, citric acid added um, in order to increase the acidity so that certain bacteria won't grow um, and it will increase the shelf life. So now we'll talk a little bit more about what types of organisms actually are causing these illnesses. So we're going to talk about these broad um, different types of, of microorganisms like bacteria, viruses, parasites, and chemicals and toxins. Um, if you're interested, there is a book from the FDA called the Bad Bug Book that contains over 300 pages worth of foodborne pathogens. Um, we're just going to brush up on some of the um, common types. So when we're talking about bacteria, um, this image here is is a is an image of a, a typical bacterium. Um, these these types of organisms they double in every twenty to thirty minutes, and remember that bacteria can be helpful, neutral, or harmful. Um, so there's this really good book out there called The Gut. Um, I can't remember the author, but it talks about the types of um, microflora that you contain in your own in your own body and in your own gut system that that help you to either digest food or um, help with your immunity. Um, and then, you know, there's a whole, a whole bunch of different bacteria that if you eat it, it's not going to produce any type of illness or any type of beneficial aspect to you. Um, they're just neutral. And then the ones that we're concerned about, um, as far as food safety, um, obviously there are bacteria that can produce harmful effects. Of So here are a few of the highlighted harmful bacteria we should talk about. The first one is Staphylococcus um, or Staph for short. This is one that about 25% of healthy people um, are carriers for, meaning they, they're not producing any illness symptoms, but they just, they have this illness, this bacteria, um, and it's being shed from their hair, skin, and nasal passages. Um, and they, they just have no symptoms. And this is also one where, where if it gets into food, um, it produces a toxin that cannot be destroyed by cooking temperatures. So think about how detrimental this would be if you, you have a food who is, is a carrier, which one in four people could be carriers, um, and they're shedding this just from their hair, skin, and nasal passages, um, and maybe not doing proper hand washing, um, and preparing food in a restaurant, um, the potential for 
for illness to occur. Another har highlighted harmful bacteria is Clostridium perfringens. Uh, I mentioned this one earlier. Clostridium is a type of bacteria that like to live in soil. And this is one also that forms those um, heat resistant spores, the little clumps of bacteria um, that makes the, the little inner bacteria um, resistant in the heat process that you might put the, the food through. Um, this is also nicknamed the stock pathogen because it's implicated in a lot of foodborne illness outbreaks where um, someone might make a big pot of stock um, and just either leave it on the stove with the, the, heat, the burner off or leave it out at room temperature for a, a longer period of time. Um, this type of bacteria likes to um, proliferate in those types of conditions. And then salmonella, of course, this is one um, that many people have heard of. Um, it's a bacteria that is most commonly found contaminating poultry products. So that's one of the main things that people hear about when they hear about salmonella. In order to kind of illustrate that potential risk, this table here, um, this is one from the USDA. The USDA is the um, uh, US-wide uh, department that regulates poultry. Um, they do uh, regular surveillance on meat processing plants for chicken, and they produce these reports uh, regularly that show like what their surveillance is on the on salmonella um, and on other um, Bristed bacteria as well, but this is a snippet from one of their reports that is showing. I'll just highlight this one little section here that it's showing that 59.9% of chicken uh, processed contains salmonella bacteria. Um, and actually this, um, a few lines up the mechanically separated chicken um, was showing at 82.9% positive rate for containing salmonella. So, you know, if you're if you have chicken and it's been processed in any way, um, I recommend just assuming that that chicken more than likely has some salmonella bacteria on it, and to be to be careful with cooking temperatures and uh, cross-contamination and all the other aspects that we're going to be talking about as far as food safety. All right, onto viruses. So viruses, um, they need a host to reproduce and they hijack cells to, to force reproduction. So in this image, you'll see uh, the, the red the red figure is the virus and it is attaching itself onto the cell wall, which is that green line of a um, of another um, cell and it is forcing in its RNA, um, its reproductive material into the cell and forcing the cell then to um, make copies of itself. And then eventually the cell is just so uh, filled with the other viruses that it needs to burst open and all those other viruses then go on to infect neighboring cells. Um, so kind of a fascinating process for viruses, but we will highlight just a few of them here. Norovirus is one that you have probably heard of um, it commonly affects cruise ships, um, and it is the suspected leading cause of foodborne illnesses. It is um, a type of virus that is just very easily spread via the fecal oral route of transmission, where if people are not um, doing adequate hand washing, it's very easy to spread it after using the bathroom uh, via a uh, door handle, um, if those aren't being properly disinfected afterwards as well. 
and hepatitis A. So this is a, a type of virus where uh, once again, there are asymptomatic carriers who can spread the illness and children we find to be um, kind of like the, the area where uh, there's the most asymptomatic population that are able to then spread it to adults and potential food workers. So it's, this, it's also dangerous because it's one that can be spread up to, if you do get symptoms, can be spread up to one week prior to getting symptoms. So even if you're not asymptomatic, you could still be spreading it prior to symptoms. So once again, hand washing and eliminating bare hand contact is critical for um, preventing the spread of hepatitis A. There's also a, a vaccine for hepatitis A, but um, not all not all people get it. And, and as we know, vaccines are not 100% effective. But moving on to parasites. So this is a picture here of a, a nice tapeworm. Parasites, they live on or inside of a host and they feed on the host. They can't live independently from a host. Then excreted in feces. The parasite that we want to talk about here is called trichinosis or trichinella. It is an intestinal roundworm that is in infected flesh or pork um, or wild game. So this is an issue when you're not thoroughly cooking your pork or wild game because cooking to an internal temperature of 150 degrees kills the parasite. And in future slides, we're going to talk about what the minimum internal required temperature is of all the different types of foods. Um, and you'll notice that that required internal temperature has to do with the, the kill temperature of the parasite or virus or bacteria that most commonly infects that type of food. So what I'm saying is the, the minimum internal temperature for cooking of your pork or wild game based on New York State is 150 degrees Fahrenheit because of the trichinella uh, possible uh, infestation. So this is a slide of a human muscle cell. Um, and it's showing here on these little um, black carrots are highlighting a circular um, Area here. Let me see if I can actually annotate. Yeah, let me see here. Is there a pointer? So this, these little areas here that are being highlighted, um, these are actually the egg sacs of the trichinella parasite in each of these muscle cells. So how it works is if you have eaten an infected piece of pork or wild that did not reach the minimum internal temperature of 150 degrees, you have some of these little egg sacs and they, they get into your stomach, but your stomach acid kind of dissolves the little egg sac here. And there, these parasites are able to come out and burrow themselves into your the lining of your stomach, or they then embed themselves into your own muscle cells um, and lie in wait and and probably hope to themselves that something is going to come along and eat you so that they can uh, proliferate further. But in the meantime, that whole process of them. Um, embedding themselves into your muscle cells is relatively painful. So, um, you know, obviously someone would be seeking medical attention at that point. But the prevention of this would have been to cook your meat to, to 150 degrees.
Okay, I'm just going to try to take off the laser pointer here. So now, uh, chemicals and toxins, um, these are types of things that can infect food, of course, things like pesticides, poisonous mushrooms, heavy metals, and scombrotoxin. Um, since not many people have heard of scombrotoxin, that's the one that we're going to highlight here. Um, so remember that bacteria are everywhere. They're in the environment out there, um, bacteria, are on the fish that you are going to prepare. Um, the fish, when, when the fish and the bacteria are together, the fish produce an enzyme that reacts with the amino acids um, naturally in the fish uh, that produces this toxin. So, so in the end, the Prevention of or the, the prevention of spoilage is key. So to prevent bacteria from proliferating on that fish is what is going to prevent the scombrotoxin from being created. Scombrotoxin itself, it resembles an allergic reaction. So something like facial flushing, tingling, rash, burning sensation. Um, the types of fish that it may infect are listed here, tuna, mackerel, bluefish, Dolphin mahi mahi. Okay, so now we're going to talk about temperatures to know. So these are very important to just memorize and remember that these are the required temperatures of the New York State Code uh, subpart 14. And they are internal temperatures. So many times people ask about like, oh, can I get one of those uh, infrared lasers that will measure the temperature of these foods? No, that's measuring a surface temperature. We want to measure internal temperature at the thickest part of the food. So you need to get a probe thermometer if you haven't already uh, to be able to stick the food um, at its thickest part in order to get these types of temperatures. So first temperature is the storage temperature for frozen foods. So when you're storing frozen foods, they need to be at zero degrees Fahrenheit or below. And sometimes people are like, wow, that's actually kind of cold because when I think of frozen, I think of 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, Remember that 32 degrees Fahrenheit is, is the temperature where water freezes. And food isn't necessarily just water. It contains fats, amino acids, carbohydrates, um, in addition to water, but other minerals and nutrients as well that might not necessarily freeze at 32 degrees. So the temperature is zero degrees or below. The storage temperature for smoked fish is 38 degrees Fahrenheit or below. Cold storage, your coolers, your walk-in coolers, uh, your reaching coolers, they all need to be at 45 degrees or below. Um, so when people see this, they're like, oh, am I going to have to, you know, buy a separate cooler for my smoked fish if I'm doing smoked fish. Um, and not necessarily in operators um, put their fish in an ice bath in their walk-in coolers and their walk-in coolers are set at 45 or below and be able to have their fish um, at 38 degrees or below. Okay, rare roast beef. Rare roast beef should be cooked to a minimum of 130 degrees. The cooking temperature for beef, fish, other meat, and reheating pre-cooked commercial foods, as well as hot storage is 140 degrees. 
So when we're talking about hot storage. We mean that like if you have um, a steam table where you're trying to hold the food hot. Um, or if let's say you are trying to use a heat lamp as soon as you are attempting to hot hold something. It needs to be held at 140 or above. Um, and then sometimes we get questions about um, beef. Well, what does this mean? Because rare roast beef can be cooked to 130, but what kind of beef is this? Um, we're talking about like a beef steak or some other, some other smaller cut of beef. Um, minimum of 140, unless it's per the customer's request that it is cooked some other in some other fashion. If someone wants a a rare beef steak. Um, and it might not reach 140 degrees. Um, you are allowed to cook that per the customer's request. I would just recommend that you um, are able to notate that somehow on a receipt. And then also I'll, I'll explain this, the reheating of pre-cooked commercial foods. So that we're talking about a pre-breaded, pre-cooked, commercially packaged, like chicken tender. That can that can be cooked to 140 degrees, um, reheated to 140 degrees uh, prior to service. All right, the danger zone temperature range is 45 degrees to 140. That's the range where bacteria like to grow. Shell eggs, they should be cooked to 145. Unless once again, it's per a customer request that is cooked a different way. Pork, like we talked about with the trichinella parasite, um, should be cooked to 150 degrees. Ground meat should be cooked to 158. Um, so we talked about 158 as the instant kill temperature for E. coli. Um, so once again, this could be the uh, ground uh, beef or ground pork. The pork is then ground. It has a higher minimum internal cooking temperature just because of the further processing it increases the potential of contamination. Reheating other potentially hazardous foods, cooking poultry and stuffing needs to be cooked to 165 degrees minimum. So this includes like a ground, um, ground turkey or ground chicken should be cooked to 165. The temperature range for your metal stem thermometer, your probe thermometer, um, when you're looking for one, it should range from zero degrees to 220 degrees Fahrenheit. So let's talk about some more important numbers related to food safety. Four inches, that is the recommended food depth for cooling most foods uh, properly. So. If you're putting food in a type of container to cool down in your walk-in cooler, uh, just keep in mind that you should not pile the food any higher than four inches in that container um, for it to properly cool. However, if we are talking about a type of starchy food item, so this would apply for anything like rice, potatoes, pasta, um, something like maybe even quinoa, um, we need to reduce that food depth even further to two inches. Um, I've been in a number of, of facilities where they maybe have three or four inches of rice in a in a container, and you know it was twelve hours later in that walk-in cooler, and and 
the rice was still at 70 degrees, you know. Um, so it, it is true that that those types of small starchy thick products hold on to heat for a lot longer. So in order for you to actually cool it down um, in a reasonable amount of time, um, you really have to have that product thin to have a lot of surface area to cool it off. So six inches is the requirement for storage of food above the floor. Um, this is a requirement of the subpart 14 code. Um, there are a few different reasons for storing food above the floor. One of them being obviously that you can clean underneath of it properly. And then the other reason is if you have food in a walk-in cooler, um, that you're actually able to get cold air circulating around that food product uh, more appropriately. 20 to 30 minutes, that's once again, the time that bacteria can double in ideal conditions. Six hours, that is the cooling time to bring foods down to 45 degrees. So um, just remember you have six hours to cool food from 120 degrees down to 45 degrees. And it sounds like a lot of time, but when we're talking about thick foods, um, you really need to implement a lot of procedures in order to meet that six hour time frame or below. And in future slides, we'll talk about how we're going to do that. Five pounds, that is the recommended portion of meat to cool in a correct amount of time. So we're talking about um, having smaller chunks of meat to cook, um, either starting with smaller chunks of meat um, or cutting the meat after it's been cooked um, into smaller chunks so that when you put it in the cooler, um, you've increased the surface area so that it can cool down within the six hour time frame. One hundred and seventy degrees. That is the temperature required for proper sanitizing of dishes with hot water. Um, and it needs to be at 170 degrees for 30 seconds. So this is something that is also specified by uh, the subpart 14 um, code. I will say that if you're using a mechanical dishwasher, you should be following the manufacturer's instructions on, on what the um, requirement is. But many times the sanitizing cycle of a mechanical dishwasher will uh, meet these requirements of at least 170 degrees uh, for 30 seconds. But you should be running that regularly to be sure that that's what's, what's happening. About a half of an ounce per gallon of water of bleach, and we're talking about the 5.25% of sodium hypochlorite solution is the proper amount of bleach uh, to be used for proper sanitizer of food contact surfaces. So once again, that, you know, estimated amount, that's about a cap full um, in a gallon of water. Ninety days, that is the time required to keep shellfish takes in order of delivery date. And that is, um, the time after you have used that product. So you should be keeping, if you use shellfish in your restaurant, um, you should keep those tags for 90 days um, in your file in order of delivery date um, after the time that it's been served. All right, in this slide, we want to make the distinction between sanitary and clean. Sanitary, it means that it is free of disease causing contaminants, whereas clean means free of visible soil. So in these facilities, um, we need food services and food service personnel to look clean and be sanitary. So in thinking about this, you know, we, we need to clean, 
but we also need to sanitize. So now we'll get into some definitions um, that are, are good for you to know. The first one being cross-contamination. So cross-contamination, that is the transfer of harmful bacteria and viruses from one food to another. Uh, this type of contamination that can be carried by utensils, humans, or equipment. So in this picture, this is a, a picture of um, one of the facilities that we have here. We are looking for cross-contamination and Get my little pointer here. So if you haven't spotted it yet, the concern here for cross contamination is these types of raw products. It looks like uh, shrimp and maybe some other you know, scallops. Um, they are stored above these buckets of sauce down here, and we don't know what what temperature these buckets of sauce might be. Uh, cook to, but they're also not covered. Um, so the concern here would be cross contamination. Um, if we saw this in your restaurant, we would want you to correct that on the spot and relocate these types of raw product to the bottom shelf. And of course, if we had seen some type of actual contamination of these products down here, we would likely have you throw that product away. So raw food products should not be stored above prepared foods such as sauces and salads. Store the raw food separately or on bottom shelves. So this is a, a type of chart from um, the state food safety that shows a way uh, to organize your refrigerators and your walk-in coolers so that um, cross-contamination is not going to be an issue. So let's see here on the side, um, ready-to-eat foods are stored at the top, and then the, the minimum required cooking temperatures that are the highest are on the bottom. So if you remember, chicken and poultry should be cooked to 165, so that's on the bottom. Ground beef should be cooked to 158, so that can be above. Shell eggs to 145. Um, so if there was a shell egg that had dripped onto uh, the beef, you're cooking the beef to 158 anyway, and it would cook away any potential contamination from the eggs. This image is highlighting, you know, using separate utensils and chopping boards for raw um, versus ready to eat foods. Uh, you would not want to be cutting up this piece of meat and then subjecting any meat juices to a salad that someone might eat raw. Um, and then down here, you know, it, it's illustrating how you can store those raw foods separately. Labeling um, is a great idea. Food should be labeled. And then also covered to prevent any possible contamination when they're being stored. The danger zone temperature range is our next definition. Um, this is one that we've talked about. That is the range between 45 degrees and 140 where maximum bacterial growth occurs. This includes room temperature, obviously. So room temperature is about you know, 72 to 78 degrees. This is why we do not want to leave foods out um, at room temperature. It is where bacteria like to proliferate. This is just a little funny comic where the 
these microorganisms are getting ready to infect these foods because the the temperature is in the danger zone in five, four, three, two, one. The unacceptable hand contact. So this is any handling of cooked or ready to eat foods without the use of proper utensils like tongs, spoons, spatulas, or plastic gloves. So this is bare hand contact, which is something that we do not want to do. And once again, this is a little, a funny comic. This bear is saying, I've been told to avoid bare hand contact. So he is using a nice little utensil here to avoid directly touching that berry. Um, so this is an older photo, but um, I was asked during our classes, is this something that you see any issues with? And the answer is, is no. Um, this hot dog bun, uh, this food service worker, they, they have some plastic gloves on, so they are not handling the bun directly with their bare hands. Um, and that would be sufficient then to use the the plastic gloves. So any foods that will not be cooked or reheated cannot be handled with bare hands. You need to handle rolls, salads, um, cold cut meats, any other similar foods with proper utensils or gloves. And sometimes, actually a lot of times, we get complaints about um, pizzas being made with bare hands. Um, and if the ingredients are raw and that pizza has not yet been cooked, um, certainly the, the raw ingredients can be handled with bare hands um, after the pizza has been cooked. It really shouldn't be. Potentially hazardous food. So this is kind of a longer definition, but it is straight out of the Subpart 14, so that is any food that consists whole or in part of milk, eggs, meats, poultry, fish, shellfish, cooked potatoes and rice or other food capable of supporting the rapid growth of bacteria or slower growth of C. botulinum. So this is also known as a PCS food or a time temperature control for safety types of food. So these are the types of foods that when you think about do I need to put this in the fridge? Do I need to keep this hot? Um, these are the types of foods where you need to have some type of time or temperature control in order to make it safe. So some of these are ones that you would think about. So like, you know, poultry products, and fish, shellfish products, uh, meat, uh, cheese and milk, um, but things like garlic and oil. So this is one that I used an example of in the beginning um, here of this presentation, but um, in thinking about garlic and where it comes from, comes from the soil, um, potentially has um, some, you know, dirt product on it and, uh, you know, people like to chop it up and prepare it ahead of time and put it in oil. And thinking about that type of condition, it is the perfect condition for bacteria to grow um, and has the potential to uh, be dirty. So this is one where if you are preparing garlic and oil ahead of time, you need to keep that product in the refrigerator. It's one that we frequently see sitting out um, it really should be in the refrigerator. Cooked vegetables. Um, any once you cook a vegetable, it needs to be in the refrigerator. So the cooking process breaks down those cell walls of that vegetable to the point where bacteria or other um, microorganisms are able to feed off of that product as well. It creates the perfect condition for them. Um, to eat that food just like you would. 
Um, so once a vegetable is cooked, it is potentially hazardous and needs to be refrigerated. Same with potato dishes that are cooked, uh, plants with uh, protein or protein rich plants. So um, when we're talking about beans, if the beans are cooked, rice is cooked, needs to be um, refrigerated. Dairy products, eggs, um, sliced melons and tomatoes. So these are listed because they, because of where tomatoes and melons are grown most often. Um, they are implicated in many foodborne illness outbreaks just based on, on the fields that they're grown. Um, and when you think about, so if you have a whole melon or tomato, that can be stored at room temperature, but as soon as you slice into it, you have potentially brought the contamination that's on the outside of that product onto the inside which is where the food is for any potential um, contamination that was on the outside uh, for them to then feed off of that product and uh, reproduce. So tomatoes and melons, once they are sliced, they need to be refrigerated. Creams and custards and raw sprouts. Um, raw sprouts is one where um, I had a professor in college, his greatest fear was raw sprouts, just because raw sprouts are grown in the same environment that bacteria are grown in. Um, and the potential for contamination is um, relatively high. So if you have raw sprouts, they should be held in refrigeration. Rapid cooling. This is a method where food um, can be reduced from a temperature of 120 degrees to 70 or less within two hours and down to 45 or less in an additional four hours. So six hours of cooling time altogether. Um, so sometimes people ask, well, why, why do I get four hours to bring it from 70 to 45? And that's just a, a product of um, thermodynamics laws. So as you get closer to the temperature that you're trying to reach, it takes more energy um, to remove those, those heat degrees. So overall, what you have to remember is that you have six hours to get a food from 120 degrees down to 45 to implement some rapid cooling procedures there. So this is a photo of it. It looks raw if you if you look at it in a, a certain light, but it is a smoked um, meat product. And remember, we're talking about improper cooling procedures here. So you remember from our important numbers slide, food should not be stacked higher than four inches if it is this type of food product. And this is clearly stacked way over, way deeper than um, four inches. Um, this food product probably would never um, cool in time. And if we were inspectors at a restaurant and we saw this, um, we'd probably stick our thermometer right here into this batch and see um, see what the the temperature is at, and then follow up with some questions to the operator of, of um, the history of that food product to determine its safety. And once again, cool foods in no more than four inch depths um, and large amounts of food like this will take longer to cool. So let's talk about ways that we can rapidly cool foods, um, the types of methods that we can implement. The first one is probably the easiest. It is creating more surface area, um, which means that we're going to break that food into smaller, shallower pans and put it in the cooler. So like if you have a soup um, and you cook the soup in a big stock pot, 
you should pour that soup out into smaller containers, multiple smaller containers, and spread them out in the walk-in cooler or the refrigerator or uh, reaching cooler that you're using. Another option is an ice wand. Um, so this is a type of device that um, you would fill with water and put in the freezer. Um, and then you can put this device into the center of a larger, um, larger container of food to cool the food from the inside out. You should, when using these, put them in the cooler as well. And you should, I caution with using ice wands because it tends to give people a false sense of security. Um, you need to be checking the ice wand. Um, and if all the ice turns to liquid, you should be swapping it out with a new fresh wand with, um, with ice in it. I've seen big pots, 20 gallon pots of, um, like a meat sauce in the past, um, in the walk-in cooler with three ice wands in it. Um, all were liquid. It had been put in the cooler the night before. Um, and that sauce was still at 80 degrees the day later um, with those three ice wands in it. So option with using it, they can be a good option, but um, you should be checking on them if you're going to be using them. So before I move on, use it like keep in mind the storage and cleanliness of ice wands. I've seen them in the past also. Um, you know, when they're filled with water and they're sitting in the freezer uh, to freeze the water inside, um, you know, they're just, they're laying on the floor of the freezer when it's like, okay, you're going to be inserting that wand directly into food. So the outside of that ice wand needs to be cleaned and sanitized prior to um, being put into food. So keep in mind the storage of ice wands as well. Another option is to leave the cover off of the uh, container of food and put it in the cooler. Um, putting a cover on food is basically like putting a hat on it, right? It's keeping the heat in. Um, you are, of course, we need to have food covered in order to keep it protected, but you are allowed that if the food is in the process of cooling, so if it's between if if it's above 45 degrees and in the process of cooling, you can have that food item uncovered in the cooler. Um, and if we are doing an inspection, um, we would temp a food item uh, prior to determining whether or not it needs to have a cover on it. So once it hits 45 degrees or below, it should be covered. Uh, but in the meantime, the cover should be off if you're trying to actively cool it. Stirring is also a method of rapidly cooling food. Um, if you think about like if you, I made, I made some chili last night um, and I had left it on the stove for maybe just, you know, a few minutes um, and I went to stir it again and you could see the steam escaping. Um, every time you go to stir it, um, stirring mixes it, you know, it turns what was on the inside to the outside and allows that heat to escape. Um, so it is a method of trying to cool foods in and of itself. Um, it's not the best method, but it is a way to help let heat escape. Another option is an ice bath. Um, you can put um, containers or like um, chunks of meat that you're trying to cool down quickly in an ice bath in the cooler. Um, that is a good method. And also, um, if you're fortunate enough to have a blast chiller, um, I know that they are pretty expensive. There's only a few in the county uh, that we're aware of, but um, that is also a way to very quickly cool food. All right, so we went through rapid cooling. 
Let's move on to rapid reheating, which is a method of heating foods to an internal temperature of at least 165 within two hours. So moving back to reheating here. So keeping in mind that we want to reduce the amount of time that food is in the danger zone temperature range, which again is between 45 and 140 degrees. Um, we want to quickly reheat foods um, so that they, they're not in that danger zone temperature range where um, bacteria or other microorganisms could uh, proliferate. So this would be something like putting the food on the stove top um, on a, an active burner prior to putting in a steam table. Um, a steam table in and of itself is not a device that is designed to reheat foods. So when you are reheating foods, we are expecting that you are reheating on a stove um, and then putting the food into uh, the tray inserts into a preheated steam table. Proper thawing. So this is a method of unfreezing a food so that no part of the food is in the danger zone for a prolonged period of time. So let's go over a few thawing methods here. The best method is going to be in the refrigerator. So this takes a little bit of planning ahead, um, but it is it is the, the best way so that you are not subjecting that food item to the danger zone temperature range. So you have to think about like, do I want that giant roast? You know, a few days from now, it's frozen solid. I'm gonna have to put the roast um, into the refrigerator um, so that it's thawed by the time I wanna cook it days from now. Another method is under running water. Uh, so when we're talking about this, we want the food item to be submerged in the running water um, so that the cool water is contacting all of the food product and not subjecting any portion of it to room temperature. So this method is, is fine to do um, if you need to more quickly thaw something because running water, and we're talking about the cold tap only, um, it comes out of your faucet between 50 and 55 degrees Fahrenheit. So this is something like if you want to use that food item the day of, um, this would be an appropriate method. But just keep in mind that the food item needs to be submerged. Another method is in the microwave. And then a fourth method is as part of the cooking process. So if you want to use, you know, like a, a frozen chicken breast and throw it into a boiling pot of water, um, that would be a sufficient way to thaw that smaller food item. All right, next definition is ROP, which stands for reduced oxygen packaging, which is the process of putting food into a package, removing the oxygen and sealing it. So these are all images of um, types of processes that use ROP um, in the top left-hand corner is a sous vide machine um, it would use, you know, you have seen sous vide bites. There are a lot of different uh, packaged meats are put into sous vide machines. Um, the 
vacuum sealer um, up on the right hand corner is one that we would typically see. <coughs> and then in the bottom, the bottom left is a process called cook chill, um, which is a process where you are filling these plastic bags with a hot food item and then crimping it tight and then very quickly freezing that item. Um, so this is not a method where you are actively sucking out the air, but the, the physical process of having a hot food item, sealing it tight, and then cooling it very quickly. If you think about how that, that food item is going to freeze, when, when liquids freeze, they typically expand it's going to force out any remaining air that was in that bay um, and effectively create this anoxic condition similar to what actively vacuuming out air would, would do. So all of these types of processes are considered ROP. If you are doing these processes, um, you need a waiver from our office. And the waiver process don't let it scare you. Um, it is a relatively easy process. Um, we just want to ensure um, that you are doing it safely because there are certain very dangerous bacteria um, that really enjoy anoxic conditions, um, Clostridium being one of them. So um, we just want to ensure that you're doing that process safely if you do want to do it. So call our office if you're interested in obtaining a waiver um, for doing one of these. This definition is called is PASIP, which stands for Hazard Analysis Critical Control Points. Um, this is a food safety method which focuses on parts of the food prep process that are most important in the prevention of foodborne illness. So this is a process that was first created by NASA in the 1970s. Um, and this was in order to keep astronauts illness free during their space excursions, uh, because the, the last place you re really want diarrhea and vomiting is, is in outer space. But so, this the HACCP process, it's really it's knowing what food products you have and what makes them safe and basically writing out from start to finish, like where did that product come from? What's the source? How does it get here? And then identifying the potential hazards and issues that can occur in that supply chain uh, from when you get it to when you serve it to a potential customer, and then putting in place measures to control um, those issues that might come into play, monitoring those controls. So if it's say, you know, we, we should take a temperature at this point, um, you should take a temperature at that point and then monitor what the temperature is going to be. And then creating a document that records all of this information and then you're reviewing and confirming that that process is working. And if it's not, you change it. You change it in your documentation. So this is something that um, a process review would be done for certain food items if you wanted to be able to commercially process some food um, and sell it wholesale. Um, Places like Cornell would be able to help with creating um, this type of documentation if you wanted to produce food items wholesale or do any type of like canning or fermenting process. But it's also something um, with our office that if you are a high risk facility, um, meaning you do um, food items that frequently go through the, um, the danger zone temperature range, 
um, or you're doing a lot of, um, you know, roasts or things of, of that nature, um, we may choose to do a type of sit down inspection or has has a review with you as one of your required inspections per year so that we can take a deep dive into a specific food item or menu item at your restaurant. So in thinking more about HACCP, think about all the things that can, can happen for food prep. You might have the, the raw product, you might have to store it, going to cook it, cool it, you might slice and serve, you might have to hot hold or cold hold some product, you might have to reheat it. There's a lot of different steps there where something could possibly go wrong. So let's go through an example of passive. And you might review items uh, practically in your facility. So this type of uh, product flow analysis is for a meat sauce, which contains uh, tomato, ground beef, and spices. So on the first day at 8 a.m., five pounds of ground beef is in the refrigerator at 40 degrees. It's then cooked on the stove to brown, and it reaches approximately 190 degrees. And then an hour later, the meat is combined with tomato sauce spices to fill a five-gallon pot. The mixture is simmered to 210 degrees from one hour. So then at 10 a.m., the pot is covered, put into the walk-in refrigerator, where the ambient temperature is 30 degrees. Based on our conversation so far, you should see an issue with this, right? This pot is, is a five gallon pot with a thick product, like a meat sauce. Um, it's simply being covered and put into the walk-in cooler. Now we know that based on our conversations about how to properly, rapidly cool food, um, this might be an issue with such a large um, pot of food, might not cool in time. So let's see what happens next on day two. At 10 a.m., the internal product temperature is 100 degrees. So we're talking 24 hours later, Product is still at 100 degrees. It's then ladled into half gallon steam table tray inserts, placed directly into the steam table, and the internal product temperature is 110 degrees when served. So, this right here, based on a HACCP analysis, um, you know, you would know this is, this is not an okay temperature. 24 hours later for this food product to be. Um, at this point, this type of this food product would need to be thrown away, should not have been served to the customers. Um, and if you were writing up a HACCP for this, you would implement a point here where you would take a temperature and monitor that cooling of that product prior to uh, the following day. So in our office, um, you can always ask us if you give us a call or send us an email. Um, we can send you some of these sheets that you can use to do your own HACCPs um, at your facility. So you can see it goes through um, a product that you might receive and store. Um, for example, then if you received uh, some ground beef, you would want to refrigerate it for, let's see here, the criteria for control would be any of these items here on this table. The, it has suggested monitoring procedures to look for and then actions to take when the criteria are not met. Um, so you can use these types of forms and go through menu items and um, ingredients you might use for your menu items. 
in your facility um, to go through what a HACCP procedure would be. And this is just the second page of that as well. So if you're interested in having these forms, you can once again give us a call or shoot us an email and we can we can send you these for your use. So now we're going to be going through a bunch of different photos um, on critical red violations. So this table shows what the New York State Category 1 public health hazards are. Um, you don't need to know or memorize the inspection form item numbers. Um, this is just for you to be aware of. Um, when we're inspectors in your facility, um, the, this list here, Category 1 public health hazards, are the worst red violations that you could possibly get in your facility. Um, and we are, we're required to uh, conduct enforcement action when we see any of these violations in a facility. Um, so we're going to be going through these first to make sure that you understand what the worst red violations are. So unpasteurized milk and milk products being used. Um, although you might see this being sold in some locations, this is not allowed to be used in your restaurant. You need to be using a pasteurized milk product um, or milk in your facility. The pasteurization process, of course, um, it's, a, it's a lower heat, it's a duration of heat that um, kills a lot of the more harmful bacteria that would be in a milk product, uh, making it uh, less risky to use in your facility. Um, this picture here, it's showing a pre-rent spray hose, kind of, and here, let me see if I can get my little highlight in here. Um, this is the pre-rent spray hose dangling down in the sink. Um, one of the more serious violations that might not look like it, but um, it is a cross connection here, um, producing a risk to the public water supply. So this, what's happening here is this free rent spray hose, it's dangling down beneath the high water level of the sink. So if there was water here, um, Consider dirty water once it's hanging out in a sink. If there was not a backflow prevention device on this spray hose, and someone was to pull a fire hydrant down the street, the backflow pot potential there could possibly suck up some of this dirty water into this hose and contaminate the public water supply. So I have a more examples here on the next page. So a cross connection, this is a physical connection between the potable and non-potable water where contamination can occur. So this is an example of a cross connection, the hose hanging in the sink connects the clean water to dirty water in the, in the uh, sink below. So this also is a common example that we'll see in like a utility sink area where you know someone's going to want to connect this hose so that they can easily fill a mop bucket down here um but there needs to be a backflow prevention device on this hose if you're going to let it hang in the in the sink and then in this hose there is not one present so just be aware of a backflow prevention device it's maybe five dollars it's just a little inline screw in device that you would connect right here. Um, this is a very serious violation if you do not have one. So this is just another example of, of to illustrate how this looks. So you need to have this physical air gap between the sink or the outlet of a sink 
and the high water level of the sink basin itself in order for there not to be a violation. But as you can imagine, um, if you had a hose attached to this and it was dangling down here, the potential risk to the public water supply, if once again, there was suddenly a backflow due to a fire down the street and a hydrant needing to be pulled, um, if there was not a backflow prevention device hooked up here, it could suck up all the dirty water and contaminate the public water supply. We have had this happen in Schenectady County in the past. A hydro seed company had um, hooked up to a fire hydrant without a backflow prevention device. There was a fire down the street and the suction was so much so that all of the chemical seed was sucked out of that tank and put into the public water supply. Um, and so all those residents that were on that line um, had a do not drink order um, until we were able to, to make sure that it was contamination free. So this is a picture here of a backflow prevention device that we would look for to be on any type of hose that could potentially lay in a sink. The little holes here um, allow the water to escape rather than being sucked back up into the line. And this is one that we, we saw in a restaurant of um, a backflow prevention device being hooked in line to a pre-rent spray hose. Um, we don't see these too often, but I would, would want to see them more often if um, if your hose is dangling uh, too low beneath the, the high water level of the sink. Um, many times you'll see that these springs over time just get really stretched out. Um, you can also replace these so that they're uh, more taut so that when it's free, free dangling, it's not um, too low. All right, moving on. Another uh, serious violation is having home canned goods or canned goods from unapproved processors found on your premises. So any type of canning um, needs to be done by someone with a, a, an approved processing license. You cannot um, do this type of canning at home and then use that product in your facility. This is just a, a funny comic. Um, we kill them, you grill them, food distributors. Um, thinking about where our food comes from, um, that is uh, a very important piece in food safety. One of the serious violations is having meat and meat products not from approved plants. Um, so we, we get complaints all the time and photos from from people all around the community. Um, this was a call that came into us of um, someone driving by um, a facility in Schenectady County and saying, you know what, this looked really weird. So I took some pictures and I'm going to send it to you and see what you can do. Um, so this is a facility in Schenectady County where, um, you know, this van with uh, New Jersey plates had been being used. It looks for transport of this meat product. Um, clearly, this is not likely a refrigerated truck. Um, if it came from New Jersey, it's not wrapped or covered. Um, this gentleman is smoking a cigarette over it. Um, and this was something um, that we ended up working on and referring to agriculture and markets to help um, enforce those issues going on there. Another serious violation is having shellfish not from an approved source or improperly tagged or labeled um, shellfish or not having the tags retained for 90 days. 
So there are many rules if you're using shellfish, um, fresh shellfish that come in the bushel bags, you need to be sure that everywhere that a portion of those shellfish are, um, they have a label attached. And the bags, they only come here. I'll show you on the next page here. This is what a bushel bag looks like. Um, if you do have these types of bushel bags, they always should be coming with this type of shellfish tag. The shellfish tag shows exactly the uh, bed that those uh, shellfish were harvested from. So if there was ever to be an issue with a foodborne illness outbreak, we would be able to help trace back uh, where that bed was to see if um, there was potential water contamination of that area. But so the moral of the story is that if you have these types of shellfish and you, let's say you want to take some of the shellfish out and put it in the reaching cooler that's next to the stove, you need to make a copy of the tag and put that copy of the tag with the portion that you took out anywhere it goes throughout the facility. It's a violation if we see unlabeled shellfish in your facility. And then one, as soon as you put those shellfish into a pot to be cooked, then is when you can take that tag and put it in your filing system and retain it for 90 days. If we see that you have shellfish, we'll be looking for the tags attached to all of the bushels or any portion of the shellfish throughout the facility, but then we'll also be looking at where you store your tags um, and how far back are you storing them because they should be stored for 90 days. <clears throat> All right, the next issue is having food from an unapproved source, spoiled or adulterated on premise. So in this photo, we're looking at some eggs. These eggs are technically unlabeled. Um, that would be a violation. We want to see them. You, you should just store them in the box that they come in. Um, that has all of the important information that we need on it to be able to say where it came from. Um, and then again, if there was any issue with a foodborne illness outbreak, um, we can use that information on the box. Uh, to be able to trace back where it might have come from. So this is an example here of um, the, in the egg cartons that you might get in the grocery store. Um, they have a plant number associated with them there and a pack date as a Julian date. And a Julian date is, um, if you're not familiar with that, is the number of days after the first day of the year. So if you have like 002, that means it's January 2nd of that year that you're in. Um, and then a sell by date, of course. But the plant number is really what's going to help us um, trace back where that uh, carton came from. And then if you do get um, some larger um, boxes of eggs with the little flats in them from your distributor, it also can have an E number associated with it. Um, we want to see the eggs just stored in this um, so that we're able to know where they came from. Another option is having um, cartons of liquid pasteurized eggs. Um, if you're doing a lot of eggs, it's not a good idea to pool eggs um, ahead of time. Um, we see issues with that sometimes when there's, you know, if it's not like a for service, but a, a really busy breakfast place is trying to uh, get ahead of the, the crowds that come in, they might throw together a big batch of uh, shelled eggs into a, a container, but then thinking about salmonella and the, the risk there, if you get one bad egg, you're mixing it in with the rest. Um, it, it's sometimes a better idea if you're doing a whole lot of eggs in that fashion to use something like a liquid pasteurized egg product um, instead. So 
So we've talked a lot in these last slides about issues with the source of your foods, where you're getting your ingredients from for your menu items. Um, so just remember that the source requirements can get really complicated. Uh, but if you follow these rules here that we've listed out, um, you should be good. So if you buy beef, pork, or sheep, or goat, remember that wherever you're getting that from, that meat product must have a USDA stamp on it. If you're buying milk and milk products, they must be pasteurized. You can't serve foods on a recall list. Um, so, so people sometimes ask, well, how do I know? I would ask your distributor if you use one. Um, many times they are already on a, a list um, and they will inform you if they, they did give you a, a food product that's now on a recall list um, and you can work with them on returning that item. I would also say that you can go to USDA and FDA's web pages and get on an email distribution list for when they do issue recalls. Um, you should just be checking that often for the types of foods that you sell in your restaurant. Their item is that fresh fruits and vegetables, they have no source requirement. Um, so you can grow your own fruits and vegetables. You can grow tomatoes in your backyard and you can use that in your restaurant. Um, Sometimes people are surprised by that, but that is that is the truth. Finally, keep your receipt and your invoice from your distributor to prove the source and just have that um, in a filing system and, and keep it. Um, I'd say it's a it's a good idea to keep them for about a year, you know, for shellfish tags, and you know, they have to be kept for at least 90 days. Um, but if you have the space, the capacity to, to keep your receipts, um, keeping them for a little longer is a good idea. I like to show this picture um, because it, it highlights and illustrates the number of different places where food could potentially be contaminated along the production chain. So if you think about where our food comes from, you know, it might be that an animal has been shipped over from a different country before it's on a farm. And um, it might then be shipped to a processing facility, then to a distributor uh, before it gets to a retail store where then you might purchase it for your restaurant. Um, and it might go off to home preparation or in a restaurant setting, um, you would be preparing that uh, for the consumer. But just think about how much power you have as a, as a food service worker. You're really the last line of defense uh, between that food product and the consumer. Um, so you have a lot of power to see like, where did, where did that food product come from that I'm purchasing? Um, is that a, a safe product to be storing? Am I storing it properly? Am I preparing it properly? Um, you have, you have a lot of control of the safety of that food item, uh, prior to it getting to the consumer. So this is just a photo of, if you haven't actually looked in, in these, uh, at these food items before, they are stamped um, with these USDA stamps. So this is a piece of pork and this is some ground beef. It does have the USDA stamps on them. Um, look for these um, if you are out purchasing food for your restaurants, uh, the beef and pork should have a USDA stamp. All right, now we're from this uh, same violation, we're going to highlight the, spo the soiled or adulterated on-premises types of foods. 
Um, these are the, the obvious foliage that we're talking about here. So in, in this, I think I believe it's some peppers, dark peppers have some some type of film growth on them. Um, in this lemon box, there was one moldy lemon here. This pie has some some mold and clearly the soup has a, a fly in it. So you know, this is one of the most surprising to people that this is such a serious violation having moldy products because I'd say this is this is probably the number one issue that we see in a facility where we have to um, have enforcement action. So the moldy lemon or lime in the big box of lemons or limes. My my best recommendation is that when you're getting this food product in, you need to be going through it before you just throw it on the shelf in the cooler. So take all the lemons out of the box that you get from the distributor and throw away those moldy lemons and limes because as soon as you have the mold in there, it has the potential to spread to the others. Um, you know, mold, mold is such an interesting um, organism. It, it can easily be spread by the, the fans, the condenser fans that you have in your walk-in coolers. Um, and we want to prevent it from even taking a hold in there in the first place. Mold affects different people differently. You know, a lot of people say, well, you know, we eat blue cheese. We, we eat these other types of foods that have mold. How can this be such a, such a terrible thing to have a moldy lemon in here? Well, <clears throat> We're talking about protecting the public, right? In the beginning of this presentation, we talked about how um, we're, we're serving food to the vulnerable population just as much as we are to healthy folks. So mold, in some cases, can really affect people if they, if they eat that type of contamination. Um, people sometimes also ask, well, why can't I just cut this mold off of this piece of food? Well, in, in some cases, the type of mold that's growing there um, is really just the tip of the iceberg. The way that mold grows, you might see a portion of it, but its roots can really go and infiltrate the majority of that food product. So even if you try to cut off a portion of it, it's possible that the roots are still in the other section that you are trying to serve to someone. So the better, you know, for this particular piece of pie, we'd have you throw that whole thing out. In the case of these lemons, we'd have you throw out the, the affected lemons that we see and then any other, any other lemons that might have some mold on them. So besides mold, since I kind of beat that to death, this is um, a picture of another type of um, adulterated on-premise. So that can also mean something like an inanimate object that has fallen into something. So this picture is of a piece of pizza that was brought to our office um, a few years ago where um, when we got the call, it was a young gentleman who said, you know, I just got this pizza. I bit into it and I bit into a piece of glass. And we said, can you just bring that to our office? Do you still have it? And he did. Um, and so right here is where you see this chunk. And um, it, it extended into a long point down here where you could see where he bit it, uh, but it was embedded into the cheese. So this ended up when we did our investigation, it, it was not a piece of glass, but it was a piece of, um, very thick plastic um, where when, when we did the investigation and the inspection, uh, we found out that the there was a disgruntled employee who had taken a, a big pan of cheese, uh, threw it on the ground in, in the kitchen area and it shattered. And obviously one of the pieces then like flew up onto a piece of pizza that was about to be cooked. Um, and they wouldn't have had any, uh, and served that anyway. 
So if anything, if anything ever breaks in your facility in the, in the kitchen area, and that's around food, the best recommendation is to throw out everything. And every food item in there that was not covered in any way should be discarded because you do not want to risk this happening um, to someone. And this is just an older picture of a little um, fly that had been sticking in some bacon grease here. Um, obviously, that's um, that's also some contamination. All right, this is a long, long violation, but it is prepared food products, contact equipment, or work surfaces which have had prior contact with raw foods and were washing and sanitizing on the food contact surface has not occurred to prevent contamination. So, in other words, um, cross contamination. So, if you have this uh, cutting board that you're using and you had just had some raw chicken on there and then you were trying to chop some tomatoes and cucumber for a, a raw salad. Um, obviously, that is cross-contamination and is a, a serious violation. Not to mention, this person is also um, chopping these for a raw salad without uh, gloves on. But so in a case like this, if we saw this in a, in a restaurant, um, we would cite the serious violation, conduct enforcement action, and we would have to have you throw away all of these products that were contaminated. So another violation is food workers prepare raw and cooked or ready to eat food products without thorough hand washing and sanitary glove changing in between. So to illustrate that, that would be something like cooking a, <clears throat> excuse me, Chopping up some raw chicken, you would need to then wash your hands thoroughly, put on some gloves before you made that raw salad. Now, I'll say that this is something that we don't cite too often, but that's mainly because it's really hard to catch in a facility. Um, we'd have to be following a food service worker for quite some time. Uh, to be able to see this, but it does happen on occasion and it is something that um, when we're doing a high risk focus type of inspection, um, we will be watching for. Another serious violation is unwrapped or potentially hazardous foods being reserved. So that's something like I always think about the little bread basket that can come to your table. Um, the unlimited bread. Um, let's say that you don't finish that bread um, when it's served to your table. It would not be um, appropriate for the food service worker to then take that bread back and serve it to another table. Once the food item has left the kitchen with the um, with the waiter or waitress and has been put on that table, it is served and cannot be taken back and reserved to another customer. So sometimes we get questions about like buffets or raw buffets like this, what's considered served. So in this case, um, you know, when we're thinking about a buffet, many times there's a sneeze guard, um, things are being temperature controlled, there are tongs and other utensils in place so that people don't need to reach in and touch the products with their hands. Um, there may also be a food service worker there who is doing some slicing or some preparation in front of you. Um, in those cases, a, the food is considered protected and not yet served. So if it's being temperature controlled, has a sneeze guard, has utensils there, has a food service worker present observing the food or slicing the food or um, serving the, or prepping the food in front of you. Once again, that's considered protected. 
Um, in the, this example here in this photo, I'm not seeing that. I'm not even seeing that these are temperature controlled. So um, there's no sneeze guard. I'm not seeing a food service worker present. Um, that would mean that these food products are served. Um, there's likely a waiver or a time frame in place that, you know, once the clock starts that they've been set there, they would need to be thrown away um, after a certain time period. All right, food workers prepare foods when ill with disease transmissible by foods. So in this, this little funny, um, you know, obviously food service workers should not be ill, uh, should not be coming to work while ill. Food workers do not use proper utensils to eliminate their hand contact with cooked or prepared foods. So once again, that's um, beer hand contact. Um, this person is tossing this fresh salad with their bare hands. We saw this in, happening in a restaurant. We would mark the violation. We would conduct enforcement action and we would need to have this product um, thrown away. So I normally ask, you know, is this an issue here? Um, showed this picture earlier. No, this person is using a barrier of these plastic gloves to handle this uh, hot dog bun, and that is just fine. What about here? Does this look um, like we have any issues here? So sometimes I get um, people saying, well, she's not wearing gloves. But that is okay because she's still using a barrier. She's not directly touching this food item. She's using a spatula. Um, and that is that's just fine too. Okay, so now we're talking about acid foods being stored in containers or pipes that consist of toxic metals. So this is something that we really don't see in our modern restaurants, but if you have an old facility or if you're, I don't know, you have some hand-me-down products, just keep this in mind that you really shouldn't be using copper pots like this um, or this type of um, galvanized um, pails that are, are really old, but, you know, they might still be lying around. Um, these types of of um, pots um, can leach heavy metals into food products, especially if the food products are acidic in nature. So like if you're making a tomato sauce, tomatoes have some acidity to them. Um, they can leach out metals from these types of older uh, pieces of equipment or containers into the food products. So once again, this is something that we will look for um, when we're in a facility um, and have you discard of these products or um, remove these products from the facility. So this is also something to keep in mind that if you use um, soda dispensing equipment, that there should be this little dual check valve on your soda dispensing equipment um, that is installed um, properly so that you do not have uh, potential leaching of heavy metals into your, into your line as well. So this, you would only have this type of, um, this type of duo check valve if you have post-mix soda dispensing equipment. So that's, that's the type of uh, soda mi mixing when you have the bags of syrup um, in boxes and you're mixing the restaurant's water with the syrup in those bags. Um, you would also then have a big tank of carbon dioxide um, that's making the bubbles. Um, so the water supply should be connected to the dispensing equipment via that dual check valve. 
um, and that valve prevents the backflow into the public water supply. So no piping should of brass or copper should be beyond that valve. Um, so beyond this valve, it should be no copper or brass. And that's because when you introduce carbon dioxide to this line um, to make the bubbles for the soda, uh, carbon dioxide is acidic. So similarly to these old pots, um, if you had copper or brass lines beyond this, it could potentially leach those metals into the line. So this is something too that um, if you have uh, Pepsi or Coca-Cola, um, and they may or um, De Crescenti, um, they could also check to be sure that um, this is appropriately installed. Um, so we have seen that this is an example that's kind of hard to see, but we have had this in the past where um, in this case, there was some brass installed beyond that duo check valve, um, which creates a, a, a very big hazard and a violation here. And this one was installed properly. All right, another issue is that food or foods um, in the public area are contaminated by sewage or drippage from waste lines. Um, so this is something that we see way more often than than I, I realized we would, but um, backups happen and when they happen, they can look like this and your facility should be closed until until this backup is is fixed and everything is cleaned and sanitized. Um, just think about the potential for contamination here. So in this case, um, this backup is right next to some of the the post mix soda bags, like we just talked about, um, you know, this, this looks like it's an ice machine. Probably, um, we've seen in facilities where we've gotten complaints before where, you know, workers are just trudging through this to continue on uh, preparing food. Um, and that's not appropriate. Um, if this is happening, you need to be closed. You need to be closed until it's fixed. Everything is mopped up, cleaned and sanitized. And any type of food product that had, or even storage of food product that had potential contact with this, if it's possible to be cleaned and sanitized, should be cleaned and sanitized, or if it's not, it should be thrown out. 